on behalf of Linda Kuhn, Dean of the Honors College, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Todd Cleveland, who is both a prodigious and popular scholar in the Department of History, um, and who is also a member of the faculty of the African African American Studies Program. And in the History Department, he is the Associate Chair and Director of Graduate Studies. So I see several undergraduates in here. If you are thinking about a career in history, this is the man to talk to. Um, I won't go into his past in the tech world, as well as his own personal and passionate connection to the game of soccer. Um, I'll leave that to him. But the courses that Professor Cleveland teach include the history of Sub-Saharan Africa, independence in Africa today, the history of Sub-Saharan African women, and apropos tonight, sports in Africa. He holds a PhD from the University of Minnesota. His research interests are broadly concentrated around the interactions between Europeans and Sub-Saharan Africans during the colonial period. He looks particularly at labor and social relations between the Portuguese and indigenous populations in the former's assortment of African territories, or for those in the know, in Lusophone Africa. His research <laughs> has focused on the history of diamond mining in Africa, sports on the continent, and most recently, the history of tourism. He is the author of six books. I will only name three of them. Stones of Contention, A History of Africa's Dining Minds from Ohio State University Press. Following the Ball, The Migration of African Soccer Players Across the Portuguese Colonial Empire, 1949 to 1975, also from the Ohio University Press. Very apropos for this evening. Most recently, um, or next most recently, actually, A History of Tourism in Africa, Exoticism, Exploitation, and Enrichment. He is currently working on a seventh, yes, a seventh book. He does not look nearly old enough for that, which examines the history of Africa in the Olympic Games. So as you can see, we could not have a better person presenting this seminar in the spring for the second time, uh, right in between two World Cups. I give you Professor of History, Todd Cleveland. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Um, it's a pleasure to be doing this again. I'm, I'm really excited. I, as you mentioned, I taught this once previously, and that was in 2018, uh, in the spring of 2018. So I'm really excited at, um, as I'm poised to teach this again. Um, thanks to the Honors College and, and Linda Kuhn uh, in particular uh, for extending me this opportunity. Um, and as you mentioned, I mean, this is just an absolutely ideal time um, to be offering this class. The men's, um, as many of you uh, no, the Men's World Cup um, will take place much later than it typically does, so not until uh, November this year um, because of the, the um, climatic conditions um, in the middle of the desert um, in Qatar. And the Women's uh, World Cup is due to kick off uh, this coming summer, so in a way this class will be uh, sandwiched right between, right between these two um, massive uh, global tournaments. Um, you know, even even offering this class would have been unfathomable um not too too uh or uh, relatively recently um soccer and sports studies more broadly have only been uh, sort of taken seriously if you will um in the academy um relatively recently and so um it's an exciting sort of young field in a way um but something that was um viewed with a fair amount of skepticism um by um, uh, folks um, within the academy uh, for, for many years, it was the type of thing you did as a second project um, because no one ever thought you could land a job uh, focusing on sports. And, and, and in that sense, um, I went that route. I'm, uh, as uh, John indicated, I'm a uh, historian of Africa by trade. Um, by around my third book, I decided I could figure out a way to marry my love for sports and soccer in particular. Um, with Africa and wrote a book about um, African soccer migrants um, to uh, to Portugal um, over the, the colonial period and then uh, did an edited volume on sports in Africa. And as uh, John indicated, now I'm finishing up a book on African Olympic Games. So um, I apparently have figured out a way to, to do both these things. And it's been wonderfully enjoyable. Um, and I, you know, I, I also teach a class on the history of sports in Africa, uh, which kind of reflects some of those, uh, the, the various efforts, um, publication efforts. So again, I, I'd like to think I'm well qualified. I'm a huge soccer fan, but I, I'm also a scholar. Uh, so I'd like to think you're in good hands um, when, uh, when this class is uh, ready to kick off, pun intended, um, this spring. So 
Um, what I want to do tonight, let me share my screen here. Um, oh, John, can you enable me to share my screen? Oh, sorry, I had you set up earlier. Sorry, that's okay. I need new button now. Oops. You should be all set. Okay, let me try again. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what I want to do tonight um, is kind of take you through um, the, the class will be very global in nature. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an African historian, so in no way am I going to focus on the United States uh, exclusively or, or even um, uh, significantly in the class, but I would like to discuss the American engagement um, with soccer, um, as I think it illuminated, illuminates a lot of the themes that we're going to be examining um, over the course of the spring, and I'll, I'll sprinkle in a few of my own experience just to um, kind of color the talk a little bit. Um, it, let's start in the 70s, because um, this is sort of when soccer comes into being in the United States, albeit very unusually. Um, so here's a photo. I, I really did try to find a photo of myself playing in the 70s or a team photo. It would have looked very similar to this. Um, this is the era of uh, orange slices at halftime, uh, teams that were known only by the color shirt you wore. So purple would play red, red would play green, and so on and so forth. Um, the coaching was abysmal, the, the playing even worse, perhaps. Um, it was not a, a wonderful era for youth soccer in the United States, but it, it got things started. And that was really what was important. It was kind of, there was an innocence to the game. People didn't really understand it, didn't really know it. There was a novelty to it as well. Um, it wasn't taken overly seriously by many folks. It was something that kids did. Um, but that all changed relatively quickly. Um, and here's an image of myself from the 1970s in a baseball hat. Now I'd be wearing a soccer, some sort of soccer paraphernalia. This is my arsenal hat. Um, and the, what, what the reason this changed was because, well, let me just talk more generally about the 70s. Um, so soccer kind of explodes onto the scene in the mid 1970s via the NASL, the North American Soccer League. Um, those of you who are um, much younger than I am um, may find that a bit difficult to believe, um, but soccer was um, just really not essentially non-existent in the United States until the NASL came along. And the most famous team, of course, is the Cosmos, the New York Cosmos. Um, so at the height of their power, if you will, they were regularly, regularly drawing over 60,000 fans, at times over 70,000. And most importantly, they were bringing in the world's best players. So, and in particular Pele, but also Franz Beckenbauer, uh, Giorgio Chignalia, um, George Bast, Eusebio, Johan Cruyff, Carlos Alberto, etc. And people, for whatever reason, there was sort of a latent interest apparently in soccer in the United States that just exploded overnight. And so you had, um, you know, this sort of huge following primarily of the Cosmos, but some of the other uh, NASL teams as well. And I remember in the 1970s, I mean, these, these players would be on the covers. Uh, of important sports magazines, Sports Illustrated, um, most importantly. Uh, matches were broadcast on ABC and CBS. I mean, this was unheard of. Um, but the league wasn't really quite ready for prime time yet. And so you had, like, for example, the, one of the funniest stories is Pele's debut is in 1975 for the Cosmos. Um, and they played at this tiny field on... Um, uh, what was a uh, Dowling Stadium uh, on Randall's Island, which is in the East River. And uh, when the, the CBS announced it was going to televise the game. And so the grounds crew had to kind of scramble and make, uh, they realized because there was so little grass on the field, but they wanted it to look good for television. So they ran around the entire field with uh, green spray paint. Um, so just an example of how we were willing to embrace it, but we weren't quite ready for it. Um, over time, the Cosmos moved to Giant Stadium, which has since been torn down and is now MetLife Stadium. Um, and so you can get the you get a feel for the kind of crowd uh, that they were able to attract here. Um, so they moved from a stadium, um, the Downing Stadium, that which had a capacity of twenty two thousand, to a place that had a capacity of uh, close to eighty thousand. Um, and so this was unheard of. I mean, it's just completely unprecedented um, in terms of our engagement, American engagement in soccer. 
here's an image of Pele um, after the last game he played, uh, which wasn't a real, it, it was a test, it's called testimonial. Um, it was between his former, he only played for two clubs in his entire life, uh, Santos in, in Brazil and the Cosmos in the United States. And he played half for Santos and half for the, Co and then switched sides and played for the Cosmos. I think he played for the Cosmos in the second half. Um, and so here you can see him being carried around the stadium, holding the American flag and a, and a Brazilian flag. And so this was really a, kind of an important moment um, in soccer history. Unfortunately, even though they continued to bring in some um, international stars, when Pele retired, um, that kind of signaled uh, America's sort of disengagement with the professional game. Um, so the, the the audiences grew disinterested. They lost uh, the NASL lost their TV contracts, um, and so professional soccer um, came to an end. Um, for the most part, I'll talk about what followed. The NASL, NASL was done by 1984, um, and it had really been flailing um, after after Pele and some of these other folks left and weren't replaced by anybody um, or anybody significantly appealing. Um, as we move into the 1980s, um, this is what sort of an average suburban soccer team might have looked like in the 1980s. And I really did, I actually, um, pulled my yearbook out and scanned a photo of myself on my high school team and the the picture quality is so poor it wasn't even worth um, incorporating in the slideshow so apologies or maybe you're okay with that because you didn't want to see me uh, when I was 18 in a high school soccer uniform um, so the sports kind of the professional sport is kind of dying um, it's disappearing from television um, I'll talk about MISL in one second uh, it becomes very low profile again uh, so it kind of recedes back into this um, sea of unimportance um, in which it floated for many years prior to the, the sudden emergence of the um, NASL and that, there's a great documentary called once in a lifetime if you ever have a chance about the sort of rise and fall of the NASL. Uh, but some, there's some really important developments. Um, women's soccer uh, grows dramatically as a result of Title IX, which was enacted in 1972. And this prompts the formation or pro initial formation and proliferation of women's NCAA teams. And also just as importantly, growth kind of, even though professional soccer kind of dies out, growth continues at the youth level and at the college level. So by 1984, more colleges were playing soccer than football, which is, seems hard to believe. Um, but with Title IX, institutions are required to balance, um, not perfectly, but um, approximately the number of male athletes and women, uh, female athletes. And so women's soccer was an, sort of an easy way for colleges and universities to add women's sports programs. And so these became extremely popular. And, you know, the, the, the significant engagement at the youth level was kind of feeding uh, these programs. So uh, I mentioned I was going to talk about what replaced the NAS NASL um, and what did is mind boggling. So the only significant soccer we had, and I use that term significant very loosely, um, was the major indoor soccer league. And so if you look at these images, I hope most of you won't remember this because you didn't waste your time watching it on television the way I did. Um, this was soccer played in a hockey arena. <laughs> Um, it was the most bizarre form of soccer um, you, you'll ever uh, come across, or, or one of the, at the very least. Um, all sorts of bizarre strategies, like kicking it off the boards to yourself as you ran by an opponent. Um, it just, it wasn't soccer. Um, it was mildly entertaining. Uh, here's an image. Steve Zungal is the, is, is the widely understood to be the best MISL player uh, of all time. Um, oddly, there was a, a number of Serbians who came to play, Preki, Stamankovic, um, Tattoo, Brazilian. So these are some of the big names. <laughs> Again, I use that term loosely. Um, on the right, you can see there's a map that, that the MISL, MISL actually had a magazine, hard to believe. Um, but nonetheless, that's all we had. And so that was on, um, you know, that was well before ESPN had major contracts. Uh, with the NFL and all these other big time sports organizations. So um, they would televise MISL games and a sort of core group of soccer junkies um, of which I was a part um, would actually waste their time watching these things. So anyway, uh, that was kind of soccer in the 80s in the, in, in the United States. Um, very big difference in the 90s as we move into the 90s. Um, the U.S., as some of you will remember, um, hosted the 1994 World Cup. Um, in a series of cities across the country. And we had an average attendance of over 68,000, which is a record that still stands uh, per game. 
Um, that was followed by the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, uh, where we had uh, the first, we had the both men's and women's soccer for the first time um, as a, as a medal, a medal event. Um, Major League Soccer, the MLS, launches in 1996, and that was actually linked to our World Cup bid. We had sort of promised we were going to do that. Um, and the, the MLS has had um, sort of fitful growth um, in a way, but it's it's certainly here to stay, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and then, of course, women's soccer continues to grow and continues to flourish. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, there's not even a U.S. women's national team until 1985, um, and it was formed sort of um, abruptly um, in response to some international pressures. I mean, so the fact that, um, you know, this all, the growth in women's soccer is, is really rapid. Um, it's happening virtually overnight. Um, the women's team wins the first World Cup in 1991. Um, it, it, it's just remarkable. And we'll talk about that in the seminar a, a great deal. Um, so if we kind of look at the 94 World Cup, um, you can see the Brazilians celebrating after uh, beating Italy on penalty kicks um, at uh, in Los Angeles um, in the in the World Cup final. Um, on the left, you'll see this sort of iconic U.S. men's team who, who performed extremely well. Um, those of you who have been following the game for a while will recognize Alexi Lalas, um, uh, Tony Miola, John Harks, um, Winalda, uh, God, who else is in there? Marcelo Baboa, um, Tab Ramos. I mean, so. In a way, this is really one of the best uh, national teams we've ever had. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of the 1994 World Cup, again, was the MLS. And really, it was the debate whether these elite uh, American players, and they're elite only in America, by the way, um, these elite American players were going, should stay in the ML or should, should, um, play professionally in the MLS as a way to try to prop up the league, uh, give it some uh, some star power um, and get folks interested um, in this sort of fledgling endeavor. Or if they should go abroad, play against much better competition, improve their skills and then return home um, to contribute to the US national team um, at, a, at a higher level, um, arguably than they could if they stayed in the U.S. And so some of the players left, some of the players stayed, but it was sort of the big debate within uh, U.S. soccer circles uh, for some time. I mentioned the 1996 games in Atlanta. Um, this was the first time that there was a women's competition, a medal competition um, for uh, in the Olympic Games. Um, oddly, Nigeria wins um, the gold medal um, with a really... Uh, a team that was not um, filled with superstars, Kano and JJ Ochoa um, were the only ones who made any significant uh, contributions at the international level, professional level. Um, but on the right, you can see some of the American players. That's Brianna Scurry, the goaltender. Um, and then, of course, Mia Hamm was on that team. Michelle Akers, Julie Foudy, um, Christina Lilly. So, I mean, that team was uh, star-studded for sure. Um, okay, so the MLS. Um, well... Initially, they kind of went big. Um, they didn't have much choice. And what does that mean? That means the New England Revolution is playing in Foxborough in the New England Patriots Stadium. That means that the Kansas City uh, Wizards are playing in uh, Arrowhead in the Chiefs Stadium. Uh, that means that teams are playing in stadiums that are far too big for the, the level of uh, attendance um, that they're able to generate. And of course, that's always depressing. Um, so whenever, if you're in a, um, a facility in a stadium and it's only half full or a third full or a tenth full, um, that's depressing. And so what they did next was they kind of figured that the American audience um, for MLS was in the suburbs. And so they started to build smaller stadiums, which was uh, prudent in the suburbs. And then, but then ultimately that didn't work either. Some of these were in awful locations. The worst one I've ever been to was in Chicago or it's not even in Chicago, it's nowhere near Chicago. It's in some industrial wasteland west of Chicago. Um, so they realized that didn't work. Um, and this was almost fatal. I mean, this was a newish league struggling, um, didn't have a great deal of capital, um, had a TV contract, but only minimally. Um, and so they were finally able to sort of stabilize matters and then increasingly started building small stadiums in downtown locations. And this has proven to be extremely successful um, for the league. And that's the, this is sort of the model going forward as they add new franchises. Um, meanwhile, on the women's side of things, here you have this iconic image um, that surely many of you have seen if you uh, if you're at all interested in soccer, and that's Brandy Chastain celebrating uh, the penalty penalty kick, uh, her that 
um, defeated China five to four in the 1999 World Cup. And so this was sort of, I mean, the U.S. women's team had already been extremely successful, um, but this sort of vaulted them uh, to the next level. Um, again, this really sort of iconic moment. Um, uh, youth soccer, uh, sorry, girls soccer increases um, and uh, numbers increased um, dramatically following the 1999 World Cup. Um, as we transition into the 21st century, soccer reemerges um, as a mainstream sport um, in a number of different ways. Um, youth, youth soccer continues its uh, remarkable growth. Uh, again, I, I talked about Major League Soccer expanding much more prudently, much more strategically. Um, women's soccer continues to grow. They host the 2003 World Cup, unfortunately, uh, don't win it. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, it's established as a, as a, a titan in women's soccer. Um, and there's significant, and this is one of the, the major developments, there's significant television coverage and access of the Premier League, uh, La Liga, um, some of the major leagues um, around the world um, on a series of different channels, um, Peacock now, uh, BN Network, uh, Fox used to, but not anymore, um, ESPN to a less extent so it's accessible so when i was a when i first became sort of an international soccer fan um in the late 80s early 90s uh your opportunities to watch soccer on american television were few and far between and so that this sort of changed everything in a way i mean how many times do we say that about television but uh, as a soccer fan this was a absolutely welcomed and wonderful development um so what else is going on in the 90s? Um, the emergence of soccer moms. Uh, soccer becomes a very, very uh, suburban sport. Um, and we have the whole image of the soccer mom with a, um, with a minivan letting off you know, four or five kids running on different you know, various fields um, ready for their games. I and mean, it's all very cliched, of course. You have soccer dads, um, generally uh, folks who don't know anything about soccer, but agree to thankfully agree to volunteer uh, and coach uh, their kids' teams. And there are lots of soccer moms too, or, or soccer, sorry, female uh, soccer coaches. I, I coach uh, youth soccer. Um, and that's been a welcome development um, over time too. And also the moms and dads are becoming more knowledgeable about the game. So they're able to um, coach the kids um, in a way that uh, they certainly couldn't have with God when I was growing up. Um, one of the interesting things in American soccer that sets it apart uh, from international soccer is that in America, soccer is a relatively expensive sport to play. And that might seem counterintuitive, um, but if you want to continue advancing in soccer in the United States, what you have to do, we have a call, we have what's called a pay to play system. So if you want to, you can start out on your local parks and rec team, but if you want to um, have serious coaching, quality coaching, um, play against better players and, and therefore improve your game, you have to join a uh, uh, a club essentially and what does that mean you have to pay for admission you have to pay the coaches are paid etc and most importantly you have to be able to travel so you might have a tournament and let's say if you lived here in tulsa and another one in little rock and another one in kansas city which means spending the weekend at these places and so soccer becomes a very expensive sport um, for american families what happens elsewhere in most places around the world is that kids who are really good um, when they're young and i mean young like six seven eight uh, are identified and they, they have opportunities to attend a soccer academy. And at the academy, they play way too much soccer, but they also receive their schooling. Um, they live there. These are dormitories, essentially. Um, they, they do everything there. They live, eat, play, learn, et cetera. Now, internationally, there's been a lot of criticism about these academies because um, rightfully so, folks accuse um, the kids of receiving a ton of soccer education and very little um, sort of conventional education. And so kids might come out of these academies um, at 14, 15, 16, 17 with really no professional prospects um, and with very, uh, un so they've been underschooled in a way, but spent a tremendous amount of time playing and practicing soccer. Anyway, very controversial. Um, some of that's changing now, uh, but I just wanted to highlight the sort of contrast between what happens in America and what happens elsewhere. Um, attitudes in general um, regarding soccer are changing. Um, here's a couple of funny things here. People say, I think soccer is boring because I don't understand it. I do understand it. It's boring. Uh, hooray, he kicked the ball. Now the ball's over there. That man has it now. That's an interesting development. Maybe he'll kick the ball. He has indeed. And apparently that deserves a round of applause. Um, you can just hear folks saying that um, who are soccer <laughs> hitters. And that's fair um, to a certain extent, if you don't understand the game. Um, 
again, youth participation uh, continues to grow. The United States is number one in the world for youth soccer participation. And the US has more girls registered for soccer than all other countries combined. And lately, what's increased the engagement or participation of families and, and kids, obviously, are concerns about American football, about uh, concussions, other head, long-term head injuries um, uh, as a result of uh, a series of hits over time to the head. And so a lot of parents um, uh, won't permit their kids to play football, even if they want American football, even if they want to. And so there's been a huge growth uh, in the youth leagues, kid, parents who still want their kids to play sports, um, but won't um, allow them to participate in um, American football. So this has helped soccer um, at the expense of American football. And that's the case in Fayetteville as well. The number of youth football players has decreased dramatically over the last five, 10 years, while soccer continues to expand, which means more fields, more coaches, more players, more everything. Um, so a positive development if you like soccer, not so much if you're into uh, youth football. Um, major League Soccer, the MLS, um, achieved some or more legitimacy by starting to attract these sort of international superstars. Unfortunately, 99% um, of these guys are um, over the hill, uh, so to speak. Um, this is what they do at the sort of very end of their career. You see an image of David Beckham there, um, pre- Wow, no tattoos as far as I can tell. Um, you know, he he kind of necessarily lead the way, but he's the highest profile player that's ever come over to the United States. And of course, he did that to kind of build his brand. Uh, although he was a very good player, um, he still had some quality years left. Uh, some of these other guys come over at the very very tail end of their career. Um, David Villa, uh, Thierry Henry, uh, Chicharito, Frank Lampard, uh, Drogba. Pirlo, Kaká, Rooney, I mean, these guys all only end up playing one, two, or three years, and this is their, essentially their last stop um, before they retire. But it raises the profile, it raised the profile of the MLS, continues to do so. Um, and it's fun for American fans to be able to see, um, for example, David Beckham play, um, whereas they would, it would be less likely they'd travel to Manchester, for example, and, and watch him play for uh, Man United. Um, See women's uh, women's soccer. Uh, the NW uh, sorry NWSL was launched in 2012, and that league is um, uh, I wouldn't say flourishing, um, but surviving. Uh, they have I think 12 teams now. Um, on the right, you see Alex Morgan. On the left, Carly Lloyd, um, two of the most sort of celebrated history uh, players in, in American soccer history. Um, and then again, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, this is this is how Americans consume. Uh, European soccer. So I'm a huge Arsenal fan. I'll admit, if you're a United fan or Chelsea, you can you can drop off the call now. That's fine. Um, but I mean, this is this is what a Saturday. This was at a bar I was at in um, uh, Baltimore, I believe, an Arsenal bar. And so if you go to these games in the morning, uh, because they're invariably on in the morning, um, because they're coming at they're you know they're they're live in England at noon or two in the afternoon. So, you know, sometimes I have to get up at 5, 5.30 in the morning on Saturday or Sunday to watch a game, um, which can be painful. Um, but this is the kind of, this is how America is consuming um, global soccer or on these sort of weekend mornings where fans of the same team come together in these uh, specifically, in these bars that are specifically designated for one team or the other um, and kind of you're engaged in sort of this imagined community. You're part of something much bigger, part of something that stretches across the ocean, in fact, um, and not just across the Atlantic Ocean, but around the world. So every Saturday and Sunday morning, I'm up, whether it's at 5.30 or hopefully a little bit later for a mid-afternoon game in England, um, texting, direct messaging, uh, whatever, um, WhatsApping, friends from all over the world, not just the United States, um, but globally. And so this is kind of what brings us together. We're all Arsenal fans. Um, we all have uh, myriad comments to make um, over the course of the game, and that's how we kind of do it. Um, but it's fun. It's, it's, it kind of brings you closer. It, it, it makes you feel part of this sort of bigger thing. Um, more recently, we've seen soccer become part, sort of appear in mainstream TV elsewhere. Um, Ted Lasso, fa fantastic show, whether you like soccer or not. Um, that's been out for, I think they've had two seasons. Um, and I just started watching Welcome to Wrexham um, at my mom's urging. Um, so I was a bit embarrassed that I hadn't beaten her to that. Um, but nonetheless, I'm enjoying that thus far. But these are sort of, if my mom knows about it, it's pretty mainstream. Um, and obviously Ted Lasso is uh, very popular and very mainstream. Um, so hopefully that was illuminative in the sense that you're seeing some of the sort of global things happening in the United States, but also the United States has a sort of a, 
uh, a bit of a peculiar engagement with the game as well. Um, I find it interesting. I don't really follow US, I don't follow the MLS particularly closely, um, but I do appreciate the history um, sort of, of our engagement with the game. And I think there's some important parallels elsewhere. Um, I just want to talk about the seminar for a little bit. Um, in the seminar, our focus, as I mentioned before, is going to be um, certainly away from the pitch. I'm not particularly concerned about who scored the most goals or um, toughest person to uh, defend against or, you know, all that kind of stuff. How many World Cups has Brazil won? But truly, the focus is away from the pitch, um, the sort of social aspects of, so uh, of soccer, economic aspects of soccer, political aspects of soccer. So um, we're, we'll move away from the game itself. Of course, different results or developments within the game will be sort of part of the discussion, um, but certainly not primary. Um, we'll explore how soccer unites, divides, engenders violence, generates the imagined communities I was talking about before, but also fractures um, existing actual communities, um, sometimes along religious lines, et cetera. Um, the political dimensions to soccer, the way that regimes in the past have used soccer for political ends. Um, clearly that's not the case in the United States, but, but it is particularly in Latin America, um, in Africa to a certain extent, and certainly in Europe. Um, how the game sort of both reflects and counters global trends regarding the movement um, and circulation of players, ideas, wealth, et cetera. Um, it's unique, rather distorted economics. Um, now we have whole countries buying soccer teams. Um, so for example, Saudi Arabia just bought Newcastle. Um, I mean, these are supposedly sovereign uh, wealth funds, but in fact, they're, uh, it's the government's coffers essentially. And so the United Arab Emirates owns uh, Manchester City. These are very, very sort of controversial developments within the game, especially considering the human rights um, record of Saudi Arabia. Um, but the Premier League and other leagues around Europe have been uh, welcomed these huge infusions um, of money uh, via these sovereign wealth funds. Um, we'll also talk about fandom, the way that soccer is confused, or sorry, <laughs> confused, consumed, um, you know, the game as a, as a spectacle. Um, I'm going to scare some folks away here now, our potential uh, enrollees. We're going to read, uh, I've assigned 11 books um, in 15 weeks, so I'm very much teaching this like a graduate seminar. Um, so beware. Um, but, I, but I did that last time as well, and it worked uh, really, really well. And just kind of walk through some of the books we're going to use. This is not exhaustive. Um, one of my favorites, Inverting the Pyramid, the History of Soccer Tactics um, by Jonathan Wilson, walks you through. I mean, soccer was obviously a very different game. It looked a lot more like rugby initially. The, the two sort of grew apart over time. Um, but teams used to play with nine forwards and a goalkeeper and, two, and a defender. I mean, it's just, it's unimaginable now um, because the squads have become so defensively minded now. Um, so it's interesting that the way, the way that tactics and players um, ideas have circulated globally. Um, so when there's a tactic that works one place, we see sort of this globalization of tactics and, and ideas um, quickly copied elsewhere. So it travels um, rapidly to other parts of the world. Um, Soccernomics, Fantastic sort of landmark book. I'm trying to understand all the sort of bizarre economics um, that shaped the game. Um, this is a fun one because it came out in 2012, I think. So it's about a decade old now. Um, so you can see the subtitle, Why England Loses, Why Spain, Germany, and Brazil Win, and Why the US, Japan, Australia, and even Iraq are destined to become the kings of the world's most popular sports. So uh, some of these sort of predictions in the book uh, have come to fruition. Uh, others haven't. It's an interesting discussion uh, to uh, to have regarding why uh, some of these didn't uh, pan out the way that uh, these are two very, uh, very well known soccer authors. We'll talk about the ways that um, soccer um, has been consumed, has um, shaped um, different areas around the world. Peter Leggi's book about um, African soccer scapes, how a continent changed the world's game. Um, you could also kind of reverse that wording and say how the world's game has, has uh, changed or shaped a continent. Um, just a great book. So um, looking forward to the students always enjoy that book. I use it in other classes as well. Um, uh, Nick Hornby's uh, Fever Pitch, as an Arsenal fan, uh, this is a must read. Uh, but it's really a fascinating book of how someone's life is so consumed by soccer. He's, he sort of um, shares his sort of unfolding life experiences um, with a reader as uh, via results of individual soccer games. Um, it's intense. It's uh, fascinating. He also wrote um, High Fidelity and hoping to have Steve Oliver kindly joined us last time, a huge Arsenal fan, even bigger than I am. If you see a car around town that has Arsenal on a license plate, that's Steve's car.
Um, you know, he, he runs FC Arkansas, um, Steve Oliver's uh, Soccer Academy, et cetera. So um, just a really colorful, interesting, knowledgeable um, guy. So I'm definitely uh, I'm hoping to invite him back for our discussions about fandom. Um, also, women's soccer, as I mentioned, this has become such an important component of the game or dimension of the game um, from the youth level to women's national team. Uh, these women, how these women have served as, as role models um, for girls uh, and boys um, as they engage with soccer and really just how profound and how uh, remarkable their success has been. Um, so definitely looking forward to that. Uh, here we have a shameless plug um, for my book um, regarding soccer migrants, which is, again is such a big, uh, which is such an important part of today's game. Uh, locker rooms are filled with uh, soccer players from all over the world, uh, from Africa, from, from Europe, from Asia, from um, South America, and increasingly from North America. So if you take any sort of elite club like Arsenal, for example, um, they're going to have players from all, you know. All, all over the world, um, largely speaking English, because the only way they can really communicate with one another. Um, so it's sort of this fascinating dynamic um, that doesn't show any signs of, of, of slowing. And then finally, um, I just want to mention a, an assignment that we use in class that, that worked really well last time, um, where you, you become sort of attached to a specific club, ideally it would be your, your favorite club, and you sort of assume the role of, fan, of a fan by following, accessing the online discourse, and writing about that, you have to have a, a proper sort of comprehensive understanding of the history of the team, and then also assume the role of a scholar by mining the relevant scholarship to the team. So it has to be a relatively big team, U.S. Women's National Team, uh, Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool, etc. cetera. Um, but I had some great papers last time on sort of uh, lesser um, or lower profile teams, especially some of the national teams, Nigeria. I think we had a paper on Yugoslavia and, and Serbia. And so, uh, um, you know, I give the students a lot of latitude to gravitate to whatever um, clubs they want, as long as there's sufficient scholarship um, related to those clubs. Um, so that's the end of what I wanted to share with you tonight. Um, I want to thank you certainly for um, tuning in. Um, hopefully this was uh, interesting to you. And I'm also more than willing to um, uh, answer any questions you might have, not just about U.S. soccer, of course, but uh, globally as well. So John, I don't know, um, I guess- You wanna stop sharing and yeah. we'll um, pull the gallery view back up so people can see. It usually takes people a minute or two to um, think of something that they wanna ask. You can unmute and ask a question or you can put it in the chat and I have that open so I can see anything that comes up. But maybe just to ask a quick word as people are thinking, Todd, you cover such a spectrum. Like, how do you put together the work on blood diamonds with the work <laughs> on soccer? Uh, it's a wide range. My, 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 quick and, my quick and easy answer to that is I'm easily distracted. Um, I, <laughs> I, I sort of get into a topic. Um, my the pattern thus far has been I write two books about it and move on to something else. Um, but <laughs> if you if you dig a little deeper, I mean, there's some threads that wind through the books. Um, we talked about you mentioned social history, uh, labor history appears in more than one uh, of these books. And in fact, the book about soccer migrants is really sort of my treatment of them as laborers and the ways that they employed labor strategies that they learned um, in Africa and sort of then applied them um, when they got to um, when they got to Europe. And so in my mind, that's a labor history. It's a sports history, too, but it's really treating soccer players as migrant laborers. And so that's the that's the sort of thread. I mean, my, my books on tourism are um, largely about African laborers and how their lives are shaped by the, the industry. So um, it, superficially, it looks like I'm, um, I mean, I'm, I'm topically eclectic uh, for certain, uh, but there is a, there is a sort of bond um, between um, all these uh, seemingly disparate uh, undertakings. I see Professor Son unmuting. <laughs> yes, uh, Todd. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi I think of a, a critical moment in soccer as being when the French won their, the World Cup, I guess it was 98, yep. and it was deemed as being this international celebration with an Algerian player as captain of the team. Yep, is it done? So that interracial and transnational focus seems to be particularly important mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a watershed moment, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Maybe it wasn't watershed, but 
I think for French society, it probably was. Yeah, that that, 90, that 1998 um, World Cup victory was really um, uh, profound in a lot of different ways. As you indicated, the team um, was very racially diverse, um, religiously diverse. So they had a number of Muslim uh, players from North Africa. They had a number of sub, uh, players who were born either born in Sub-Saharan Africa or had parents who were born in, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, and that, that permits them to play um, for the French national team if they're residing in France. And so there was a very, very diverse team. The fallout from that, I mean, th there was a moment when you know more about French society than I do for certain, but there was a moment when this was sort of the new France, we should embrace this, we have a very sort of diverse society. The sort of fallout of all that was um, not too long after that, there were, there were a number of um, memos, documents, etc. exposed um, within the French Football Federation um, that indicated that they wanted more white players. That the the French brass within the the uh, foot, within the federation was concerned that the team was uh, browning, if you will, too quickly. That there needed to be more white French uh, soccer heroes, um, and that the the team was becoming it looked like the empire in a way, and it didn't look French enough to them. And so that was really scandalous and really sad because there was that there was a, that that sort of goodwill that that good feeling that followed the ninety eight World Cup when everybody did realize that wow this is a, is an incredibly diverse team, but also very reflective of some of the some of the best clubs in the world. So if you go, there was a there was a great deal of alarm when Arsenal was Ar Arsenal was the first club to field a starting eleven with no English players. And if you know anything about the English, they're, they're very un that's very unsettling to them because it's their game they invented it um and so there was that you know to me it's wonderful it, it just it, it internationalizes the game it reflects the sort of global movement of people laborers etc um and there was that moment in france that was kind of lost or at least um, sort of undermined by that um by those revelations thank you uh -huh. I, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, I know a young man who was very talented and uh, soccer player, also a brilliant poet, okay. um, graduate school here in the MFA creative writing program. And I remember him telling me that he wasn't able to continue because his family couldn't afford it. Yep. And um, so I was really surprised to learn about that. So I was wondering, especially with people becoming more concerned about football being, um, you know, having long-term impacts on players, mm -hmm. why not have soccer be the, the the sport that is played in high school where you don't, you know, the, the high school, the school district pays to take you to travel around. I mean, is that happening? Yeah, it's just that the, like, the coaching, um, even, even within the public school system isn't sufficient. And so you want sort of more professional coaches, um, not the guy who also coaches basketball, or who's the, you know, the phys ed teacher, um, which is what I had in high school. And so you want that sort of exposure to more um, established, more professional coaches, and also the ability to, to travel further than, you know, high schools typically do. Although in Arkansas, Fayetteville is forced to play schools uh, because of its size size, um, you know, at, at reasonable distances. Um, so it would, so it's happening to a certain extent where the high school sort of takes on some of this um, financial burden, but there's this, um, you know, ask if you, for example, if you know anybody around, you know, kids who are really talented in soccer around here who are 12, 13, 14, they'll either play for the Springdale Comets um, on the side, in addition to playing for their public schools, or they'll play for uh, FC Arkansas. And so there's just this thinking that you can't you can't excel or you can't continue to progress unless you augment what you're getting through the school system with some sort of private um, uh, engagement, you know, with a private entity essentially. Hmm, that's interesting. It's a shame because it's you know there's talented people who can't progress because they can't afford it. Yes, that's been a huge concern. There are some academies opening up in the United States. Um, these are brand new. I think, uh, I don't know, it's it's too new to even sort of speculate how these might be uh, welcomed or not by parents of of supremely talented uh, soccer, young soccer players. So we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, there'll be much more regulation in the United States than there will be. So for example, West Africa, in particular Ghana, and to a lesser extent, Nigeria, are famous slash infamous for the sort of preponderance of academies. And some of them have very little regulation. There's some really sort of 
uh, unsavory things that go on in these uh, in those um, settings. And so, at the very least, the U.S. the the academies in the U.S. will be better regulated. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a question in the chat, uh, Professor Cleveland. Could you talk a little about Afcon and the revitalization attention it has gained in the last few years? with many high profile athletes, which lists some names after, and says Africa isn't new to this stage. Also maybe the racial chasm in South Africa between rugby and soccer, great presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, Africa, African Cup of Nations um, is a tournament that's held across the continent um, every couple of years. Um, it's been, it's, it's problematic if you're a manager of a European football club and some of your better players are African um, because they'll be gone for four to six weeks um, every other year. And so this has hurt the, uh, or it's sort of uh, reduced the appeal um, at times of African players. African players typically are relatively less expensive to purchase um, and you know that sounds awful, but that's how soccer works. Um, you buy players. Sorry, you pay another club for the player. So players are bought and sold. Um, and so there is that appeal, but when they're leaving to for AFCON every other year, um, that's been problematic for some of these players. And you know, even worse, even more so if they go to play for their their um, their country and end up injured during the tournament. And then not only do they miss the the sort of period of the tournament, but then they're you know on the sidelines for weeks or months thereafter, or even more seriously injured. Um, so that's been very controversial. Um, it's a fun tournament. I, I enjoy watching it. It's not been, it's not particularly well attended even on the continent. So even as you get to the later stages and the knockout rounds, um, you'll see the stadiums often only partially full, um, which is too bad, but that reflects a broader trend in Africa and that uh, the Premier League, the European leagues are much more, um, much more popular than our domestic leagues, not just because of the gulf and talent, but um, because there's a long tradition of identifying, this goes back to the colonial period, where if you were an African, um, you you sort of wanted to have a favorite European soccer club so that you might enter into a conversation um, with your somebody in the administration or your employer or something. It was a way to sort of build a bond um, within the sort of, while still regarding the racial hierarchy that was in place in, in colonized Africa. And so if you if the best two teams are playing in Ghana, um, Hearts of Oak, for example, and um, the name eludes me right now, I'll, I'll think of it in a sec. Um, and at the same time, Chelsea's playing, uh, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't need to be Arsenal or Manchester United or Man City, uh, somebody else. There'll be many, many more people, um, millions more people around the country watching that game on TV than would venture to the stadium to watch the game. The stadium might be half full, um, but there'll be um, hundreds of thousands, if not more people watching in Africa, watching a European game on TV at the same time. Um, uh, the other question was about, uh, John, what was the end of the- Rugby versus oh. soccer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so South, South Africa, Africa is uh, really interesting in terms of its um, the way that it uh, divides, sort of self-segregates uh, based on sport. And so rugby is a very white sport in South Africa, uh, probably the whitest sport. So it's golf, I suppose. Um, and um, uh, soccer is much more followed, practiced, etc., cetera, um, by the black South African population. Um, <sighs> A lot of it has to do with racial politics in contemporary South Africa. Um, but if you go back into the apartheid period, um, you still have these sort of same divides. There, there used to be more white soccer players in South Africa. Um, so the fact that it's become almost exclusively black at this point um, is a little is a bit of a more recent development. There are some black players in rugby. Really, rugby is much more interesting for me, given the sort of racial controversy in South Africa. They're always reluctant to introduce quotas because they don't want to undermine the, the argument is they don't want to undermine the effectiveness of the team um, because there's only about six elite rugby playing nations um, internationally in South Africa is one and the white population takes rugby extremely seriously. So though you had this moment where um, uh, Invectus, the, the, where South Africa won the Rugby World Cup in 95, uh, nah, that might not be right. I, I do not confess to be a rugby fan. 
uh, I'm happy to admit. But uh, when they won the World Cup and Mandela was wearing the Springbok jersey, I mean, that was a moment, um, but it wasn't a durable one. Um, and so if you go to a, if you go to a soccer match, um, I've met, been to many soccer matches in South Africa, there'll be some white audience members, but it's mostly um, black fans. And then if you go to a rugby match in South Africa, um, it will be almost exclusively white. And so that that racial divide persists um, despite the decades that have passed since the end of apartheid. I hope that helps. I think that is a fantastic answer. Do we have any, ah, I see another question from Carson Duca. Uh, what will grading look like in this course? Will it mainly be writing assignments? Practical question. <laughs> exactly. Um, I don't have the syllabus in front of me, but uh, basically the course will be run um, like a graduate course. So you'll have a book um, almost every week, not every week. Um, and then you'll be required to submit a one to two page sort of reaction paper and, you know, kind of work on um, with the students on what that looks like. So the writing is relative. There's more reading than writing um, to a certain extent. Um, but then that that uh, paper that I outlined, sorry, that project that I outlined, the fan and the scholar project um, is relatively significant. I think that is. Uh, oh, I do have the syllabus here. Um, while you're looking, I'll just say, Carson, it is exactly what three semesters of H2P has prepared you for. <laughs> exactly. So that's, a that's, that's sort of a culminating paper. That's 12 to 15 pages. But really what's most important is discussion, is your contributions to what's a relatively small cl uh, class. John, I can't, it might be capped at 15, something 15, like that. Getting on where you want. I bet we'll go to 16. Oh. We have another question from Esther Beller. Title IX was really able to help the growth of women's soccer in the U.S., but is there anything helping the women's game develop in other countries? Also, go Hotspurs. <laughs> <laughs> Boo. Uh, well, you, you had a bad day today, so <laughs> you're already reeling, I suppose. Um, that's a really good question. Inherently, uh, not inherently, but soccer has been popular. Women's soccer has been popular in Europe for some time now. And so it didn't take something like Title IX uh, to spur an interest into um, women's soccer. That said, of course, women's sports in Europe, um, you know, don't have the following or the standing that uh, men's athletics do, uh, despite the, the reasonable popularity or relative popularity of women's soccer. Um, Internationally, uh, FIFA has actually put a lot of money, the, the world, to so the global governing body, to support um, independent nations' um, development and cultivation of, of women's soccer. So there is some money um, flowing into the sort of development projects. Um, so, but in the developing world, you know, resources are always reasonably scarce. And so national soccer federations don't typically allocate a tremendous amount of money um, for either their men's team or their women's team, although, of course, disproportionately it flows to the men. So FIFA is trying to make up some of that um, gap, but it's a significant gap. And women's soccer is sort of undervalued and underfunded, um, certainly in Africa, unfortunately. Okay, the questions with pot shots just keep coming. How long do you give it before City inevitably passes Arsenal <laughs> at the top of the league? Uh, if we can make it to the World Cup still top of the table, I'll be thrilled. But it it is inevitable. It will happen. I do agree with you. <laughs> All right. Do I'm we put my Arsenal hat on now and get my Arsenal scarf on if I'm going to be fielding these types of questions? I won't go back to all the old jokes about soccer players versus soccer fans. <laughs> uh, proving it true tonight. Do we have any more questions from all of those of you online? In a minute or two. I knew this was going to be a lively one. <laughs> all right. Remember, this is a spring 2023 signature seminar. It is a course by application. You can go to our link, which I'm going to put in the chat shortly that will give you all the information on the class as well as the link to the application. And um, as Professor Cleveland said, the course cap on this is tentatively 16. We can't go much beyond that because we want you all around the table in one room. And it's going to be, as you can see, a marvelous um, opportunity to learn about sport as labor and sports role in globalization, but also 
to engage in a little fanboy and fangirl rivalry, it sounds like to me. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Oh, let me just pull up. And as a reminder, this is going to be from 2 to 4.30 on Wednesdays. And I am putting that link into the chat now for those of you who didn't have the course page link. Any final shot? If not, thank you, Professor Cleveland. That was entirely engaging from someone who the one bonus of leaving Philadelphia was leaving all of my soccer fanatic friends who could talk about nothing else. You almost <laughs> made me miss it. Uh, on behalf of Linda Kuhn, Dean of the Honors College, and our Honors College staff, everyone have a fantastic evening, and we hope to see you in soccer. <laughs>